I want you to read the passage with me this morning. This is the one we're studying. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And I really would like you to get it into your heart and soul and mind. So it'll, it'll make for a good uh, uh, congregational reading for us. Uh, forgive me if your eyes can't see it. If you can't see it, don't worry about it. Everybody else read it. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. Wait a minute, I don't hear anybody reading. I need at least one or two. Okay. See, I can't see it all that well back there. Uh, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I would suggest, friends, that you should start doing your rapture exercises. Because I know we've been saying it for a long time. But it's got to be soon. How many of you remember back to the days when there were elevator operators? Oh, yeah. you remember that? And then somebody got the big idea that you could punch the button yourself and they could save money. So uh, we got rid of most of those guys. But you'd, you'd go to the open elevator and they'd always say, going up yeah. or going down. <laughs> I'd like you to uh, let me play elevator operator today because that really is my question to you. Going up, <laughs> going up, or going down. Uh, it's a serious issue. We're going to be talking about this issue of uh, the rapture of the church. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. That's, that's our word right there, caught up. Uh, anytime you hear people say the word rapture isn't in the Bible, uh, no, it's not. It's in the uh, Latin version, uh, rapieri, or rapieri, I think it is. Uh, it's not in this. If you want to call it the great snatch, if you want to call it the harpazo and sound really intellectual and neat, that's the Greek word. It doesn't matter whether the word's there. The thought is there. There's going to come a time when the Lord will catch up his people. Uh, not all Christians believe there is a difference between the rapture and the second coming. Uh, but of those who do, we don't even all agree on how it's going to be. But uh, that's why I want to give you some uh, other books you might read. These are all favorites by my, uh, of mine. Any book by Mark Hitchcock, uh, very good stuff. I would say right now he is the top writer in this field. Comes from my alma mater, mm -hmm. Denver Center. Tim LaHaye is old enough to know when the rapture is going to be. So anything he wrote, I like. Uh, a new guy, Joel Rosenberg. Uh, he's not writing so much on prophetic issues right now as he is Muslim issues. And he will scare the living dickens out of you. But, great author. I will still go back to this book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And if you would go back and read that now, you would see that Hal Lindsey, although he wrote this a long time ago, you go back to the back where he says, look for this in the next... Uh, 20 years. Now, Hal has had his spiritual problems, I will say. That doesn't detract from the fact that this is a, a great book. 
very simple one. Uh, John Hagee writes good stuff. People either love or hate John Hagee, but I think he writes good stuff. Uh, Grant Jeffrey. Uh, any book by him on end times is usually great. Not only do these guys obviously agree with me, but I... Th <laughs> that, that helps. <laughs> But I think they are fair in dealing with the other opinions. I mean, and this is why I don't see why Christians get so, oh, we take different It's all right. We'll, we'll find out. Well, what we're trying to do is study the Word, and these, these guys can help. Uh, Dave Hunt. Dave's pretty intellectual in everything he writes. Um, he has helped me in some passages that nobody else has. Uh, he can be a little, I um, think his, his way or the highway, but he's a good writer, has good stuff. Uh, the book you really want is this one. It's called the Bible. That's, that's really, really the book you need. Uh, this morning, that's the one we're using, and uh, I'm not going to offend anybody too much because we're not going to deal with all the other views this morning. We're going to be talking about the fact of the rapture and not the timing, not the when. You remember last week I uh, took you through sort of a timeline of, of history. Uh, we started with the fact that Satan was probably created before, well, he was created before Earth was, we don't know when he fell, whether he fell from heaven before the creation of earth or after. Anything would be pure speculation to say. But God did create this earth. And Satan, having been booted out of heaven, used all of his influence to tempt Eve. And we have the fall of man. When uh, Adam and Eve gave in and listened to the serpent rather than God. They, they followed Him uh, rather than following God, and that's what has gotten us all into trouble. That's why sin has passed upon all men. doesn't matter whether you like it or agree with it and say, ah, Adam didn't do that for me. Yes, he did. But you are proof that he did because you keep biting that same fruit. Every time you sin and every time you think, oh, I did it my way, you're, you're proving that you are of the same family. But God promised from the beginning to send a Redeemer, to send the Messiah. Uh, by the way, I've noticed in my reading about prophecy on the internet that uh, a lot, a lot of Jewish Christians have websites on this issue. Uh, they have differences of opinion from here to there, but I, I had never seen so many until I was looking through last night. But our Lord Jesus was promised to come. God chose out of the human race a chosen race so that through Abraham, Jesus, the Messiah could be born. Now, we are in this period of time, 2,000 and about years since the time of Christ, and we're waiting for the future. Actually, we might even be future tense. I don't know of anybody right now who doesn't think something is going on. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, we've heard that for years and years and years. <laughs> uh, I would have thought when Hitler was around, he would have been the one. As somebody has said, uh, you know, maybe Satan has a man set up for every generation. We don't know. It's the thought. But we're told that God has a, a last seven-year plan for the Jews. Seven years in which He's going to fulfill all of His promises for them. He is going to bring them to Himself, at least a third of them, according to Zechariah 13. And He is going to bring judgment against the Gentile world as well. It is called Daniel's 70th week, or seven years of what a lot of people call the tribulation. <laughs> there is the teaching from 1 Thessalonians 4 of the rapture. 
but we do not all agree on when it's going to be. Some of us believe it's going to be before, and it could be a long time before the beginning of this last seven years of, of a time so horrible that, that Jesus said nobody would be able to make it through if the time were not cut short. It's going to be seven years. That's it. And uh, God will use it to cleanse His Jewish people and bring His promises to them. Some of us believe we will be taken out of here before then. I'm still pretty convinced. Uh, if I'm wrong and I see them sign a treaty with the Jews for seven years to rebuild their temple, I will suddenly become what we call mid-trib. <laughs> that is, the Lord is coming in the middle of the tribulation. Because honestly, I can only prove that the last three and a half years is called tribulation. Uh, although I think all of it is. We'll get to that in more detail later. But I, I might change to that view. I'm sorry, I just don't go for the pre-wrath view. I'll explain it to you a little later. Uh, this is some who believe that the Lord's going to come about five and a half years through the tribulation. Uh, and then there are those who believe that uh, when the Lord is coming, uh, we will rise to meet Him and come back with Him. The only problem with that, sounds good, but Jesus said, I will come again, I will take you to my Father's house. That doesn't allow any time to go to the Father's house. I want to go there. I don't think it's going to be then. But I have good friends who believe that. So uh, we'll talk about that issue too. But let's just talk about the rapture. This is the same event that I think Paul was describing in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Not the second coming. The second coming was already known about in the Old Testament. But Paul was given a mystery, that is, new truth that had not been revealed. And this is it. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. I have to tell you, this is probably the most preposterous uh, doctrine that Christians could ever believe. But it's not unusual biblically. When you think about it, there have been other times in human history when God has snatched people out of here. Snatched them out without dying. You probably remember most of them that I do. I think first of all of Enoch. Genesis chapter 5, 24, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. He was not what? Oh, he was just not. He wasn't around. <laughs> little girl trying to explain to her mom what her Sunday school teacher taught about Enoch. And she, she explained, well, Enoch and God were walking together. And one day God said, Enoch, you know, we're a lot closer to my house than yours. Why don't you just come on home with me? And it's not a bad explanation, but Enoch was just... <laughs> Snatched out of here. Uh, also, you remember Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 and 11. Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Now, Mark Hitchcock in his book lists some others in the Old Testament. I'm not sure I agree with him. I didn't agree with him enough to put them down here. But, but that's fine. He's, he's still a great guy. Uh, he would say, and I agree, that maybe because Enoch and Elijah were taken out of here without dying, that they will be the two witnesses in Revelation 11, who after the temple is set up will come out on the streets and say, this is a treaty with hell, and this is the Antichrist. This government leader is not God. He is not a good man, and they will be killed during the middle, and then they will be resurrected to heaven. And so there's some belief that it is Enoch and Elijah. I usually think that's my point of view, although sometimes I go with somebody else, like Moses, but that's a different point. Uh, Paul also was caught out of here. I don't know if you can read that. I'm having a hard time reading it back there. But in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, I know a man who 14 years ago whether in the body, I do not know, or out of the body, I don't know. You know, when you have 
experiences, you know, quite the what's going on. I think this was when Paul was stoned to death. Uh, he's, he's, I, I don't know exactly what happened, but uh, such a man was caught up to the third heaven, that is, heaven, where God and his angels are. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. I find it amazing that, that Paul was taken out of here and taken to heaven, and God wouldn't let him say anything about his visit there. And yet there are a lot of books on the market today I want to tell you about people who died and went to heaven. I, I'm sorry. I have a little problem with that. Um, wouldn't be ugly to them at all. Some of you love those books. You say, it makes heaven more real. No, heaven's real, not because of that. It's real because it's real. But Paul did go there. And uh, so he's one of those examples of snatching away in Scripture. This is the same word, and you notice the caught up, caught up, caught up. Same word that is used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, of being caught up, the harpazo of those of us who are believers. And Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed brethren. The King James Version, you remember, says, I don't want you to be ignorant brethren. Warren Wearsby I don't know if you know that name, great man of God, great pastor, great teacher. He used to say the fastest growing church in America is the church of the ignorant brethren. <laughs> Paul did not want the Thessalonians to be ignorant brethren, uninformed brethren. And I would say to you, those of you who say, well, prophecy stuff is, is not all that important. There's more important stuff to cover. Well... Paul thought it was important. Uh, he writes about it here in chapter 4, chapter 5, and all the second Thessalonians. He, he must have thought it was a pretty important thing for us not to be uninformed about. He says uh, that about those who are asleep, those who have died, those who have gone on. He doesn't want them to be uninformed. You remember he had started the church in Thessalonica, on his second missionary journey in Acts chapter 17. And uh, he had apparent, we know he was at, there at least three weeks. He may have been there as many as six or seven. But uh, he taught them about the rapture, about the end of times. I am convinced Paul thought the Lord was coming in his time. That's why it doesn't bother me to think he's coming in my time, and he's going to either take me out of here one way or the other. I'm not that concerned. But I can see things happening in the world in my day that Paul didn't see happening in his day. Yet I think he was very sure the Lord was coming back until you get to 2 Timothy chapter 4 when he knows he's going to die. So Paul is in Corinth. He left Thessalonica. He is now in Corinth. And he's concerned about the Thessalonians. They, um, they might be having some problems. And so he couldn't go back himself. He sent Timothy. And Timothy brought back um, issues that the Thessalonians were having. And the, the issue Paul begins to deal with here is about those who were asleep, those believers who were dead. Uh, actually, the word sleep is uh, uh, a Greek word which just means to be down, to lie down or to, to sleep in a bed, sleeping, dying. Sometimes it's different, difficult to know the difference except the degree of depth that somebody might be in. But Paul used that word because it was uh, an appropriate word to describe the death of believers. But I want you to understand that there is a theological issue here that causes some people difficulty. Some erroneously teach that Paul was talking about the death, the, the sleeping of the soul. It's what they call soul sleep. 
I know Garner Ted Armstrong teaches soul sleep, uh, perhaps some others. I don't think that's what the New Testament teaches at all, or even when we go back to the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7 says, Then the dust will return to the earth, that is, the ground as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. So Solomon tells us there that the body goes to the ground when it dies, but the Spirit goes to God. And I think that's exactly what Paul had in mind when he said in 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. And the, the whole essence here is that absent from the body means being at home with the Lord. Not here, here. In fact, Paul was so uh, concerned about the issue, as some others would be, that he asks the question, sort of, how can that work, being in heaven without a body? My technical friends would say, there's an app for that. Um, God has an app for that too. Uh, Paul mentions it earlier in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, for we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, when this body's gone, that's his idea. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house, this body, we groan. Oh yeah, why do we? And by the way, I thought this through a lot. I've been griping a lot lately, whining. You know, about, I, I know, I, I know it's true. I've been wrestling with this. But I like what the lady said when she said, when the Lord brings you tribulations, you're supposed to tribulate. So, <laughs> I've been tribulating too much. But you, you understand what, he's saying in this house we groan, boy, do we. Uh, Longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. Paul says there, there's, a, there, there's a body in heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, he explains, it's not a, an earthly body, but it's a body. And just because you don't understand that doesn't mean it's not a real body. There are different kinds of bodies, Paul says. But then that kind of brings you to the question, why then is God going to resurrect these bodies? I could use, again, a very modern day thought, and that is maybe he is big on recycling. <laughs> <laughs> but if I were honest with you, I'd say, I don't know. I don't know. I, I do not know why he wants to use this. I, I couldn't find anybody else who seems to know in any way that I thought was worth sharing with you, but God says he's going to do it, so I believe it. And he is going to bring this body together with our spirits, put them back together, and make them perfect. Now, I can go for a body like that. Yeah. We'll be talking more about the resurrection body later. But Paul says, I want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you do not grieve as the rest who have no hope. Um, what's the problem here? I honestly think I must be a little dumb because I read all the commentaries and they go on and on and on about what, what the problem was. Why the Thessalonians were concerned about their dead loved ones. I won't even tell you all of the possible theories or concerns. But I think one, perhaps the Thessalonians knew very little about the resurrection. They were probably mostly Gentiles. Remember, Paul would go into a city and he would go to the synagogue until he got kicked out, but his purpose was to reach Gentiles. And if you were to read in the Gentile world in that day, you would read things like this from Ascylus. Of a man once dead, there is no resurrection. That's what they had been trained in are this from Theocritus. Hopes are among the living. The dead are without hope. That's the kind of Gentile 
teaching they had received. Or this one from Catalyst. Suns may set and rise again, but we, when once our brief light goes down, asleep an endless night. A group of Jews would have understood something about the resurrection. But it may be possible that this group of Gentile believers didn't know much about it. There's a second thought, and, and that is, I think it was just the whole issue of the unknown of death. Uh, you all have been well taught about what the scripture says about life after death and, and all of these things. But you know, when we, when we get near the end, I still see people wonder because there's an unknown there. And Paul surely wondered about these, uh, uh, these folks. And apparently, and this is my opinion, I don't think from his responses here he had ever explained to them how the Lord's coming would affect their dead loved ones. And so they're wondering, are they going to miss it? Are, they, are, are we going without them? Are they going to have to... I don't know exactly what the issue was, but anytime you've got loved ones dying, there's a concern. I do want you to notice, though, that Paul says, uh, Thessalonians... We grieve, we just don't grieve as those who have no hope. Uh, when we lose loved ones, that's, that's, a, that's a tough thing. We grieve. We just don't grieve as those who have no hope. And I have been to funerals. Uh, fortunately, I've never had to conduct one like that, where people just wailed and wailed and grabbed at the bottom. Just, it's a horrible thing. Grief is one thing, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope. I'm convinced that my dead loved ones in Christ I will see again because that's what the Word of God teaches me. Well, Paul doesn't want them to be uninformed, so now he's going to inform them. And this is what he says. I don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep. He says, for notice, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. That's the gospel. Uh, he, he's got to get all of this in here. You have to understand that the only way you can uh, be in this life and uh, grieve with hope is if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. <laughs> but if you are not, there is grief that is without hope, period. And, and so Paul wants them to understand the gospel. And he says, God will bring them with him. And the word he uses here is, is bring. God is going to bring the spirits of those who have already died in Christ with him, and they will rejoin the body. But Paul says, you're not going to be ahead of them. They're going to be ahead of you. They get a little head start on you. I don't know how that can be in the twinkling of an eye. But good night. Who am I to argue with twinkles? Uh, the purpose, Paul says, is to unite them with their bodies and to give them transformed bodies. And uh, we've talked about the whole thing of grieving here. But here's where I want to, I want to just stop a moment and talk about no hope. Uh, it, it hurts me to have to deal with issues like this. But there are some of you here this morning, honestly, some of you have come, uh, I don't know how long, and you still have never trusted Jesus Christ. And I don't know how to tell you this, but you have no hope. You have sat here, and you have listened, and you have heard the gospel, and, and, and for well, I come to church, don't I? Doesn't that make me a Christian? Yeah, like going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. No, no, it doesn't. But I, I think that is what some folks must must believe. Um, that's why the gospel is is so important. I don't know if any of you remember your English literature days, but uh, there is this expression supposedly over hell. Abandon all hope, you who enter here. From Dante's Divine Comedy. Not much of a comedy to me. 
abandon all hope. And that's what I'm sharing with you. Um, if you are here this morning and you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I, I want you to think about your life. Um, you might as well go with the beer commercial and grab all the gusto you can get because you only go around once. They say, that is a lie, but it is what you have believed. Otherwise, you would have trusted Jesus. But some of you haven't. So look at your life. The house. The car. You happy enough? Because it's all you got. And it's all you get. It's all there is. No hope. That concerns me because I'm supposed to give you hope. That's my responsibility. That's my call. I am called to present the gospel to you. <laughs> hey, preacher, all my friends are going to hell, so it won't make any difference. Yes, it will. Huh? The Bible says hell is a dark place. You won't believe me, you won't see your friends. A place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. But you might sit here and say, well, I haven't trusted your God because I couldn't possibly believe in a God who is so intent on sending people to hell. Well, that's because you haven't been listening. God doesn't send people to hell. You know what you've got to do to go to hell? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Adam took the bite of the fruit for you, passed it on to all the rest. You prove you're a part of the family against God. Every time you bite, every time you say, God, I'll do it my way, every time you say, I don't need anybody else, you prove that you're part of that family that has raised their hand against God and said, no, God. And by the way, that's what a true atheist is. It's not a no, God. A true atheist is an anti-theist. No, God! I will not have you over me. But there's no hope in that. So I do want you to sit here this morning and understand that I am going to give you a chance at the end of the service to trust Jesus. And I'm going to make you sweat. <laughs> because some of you are headed to hell. Not on my watch if I can keep from it. Yeah. And you come to church because your spouse pulls you. In second service, our children come because their parents make them. I want to tell you about hope. Paul wanted them to know about hope. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And then he says, for the Lord himself, and we'll get to this better next week, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. Now, some believe that this, therefore, is the trumpet of God and the trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation, and I don't think they fit there at all, but we'll talk about that later. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up, snatched up. You remember as a kid getting on the elevator and that, that feeling, you know, in the stomach goes, whoa, whoa, and went up and that elevator would stop. And, man, this is going to be the greatest elevator ride you can imagine <laughs> when the Lord returns and takes believers out of here. Now that leads me to the question I, I started with this morning. You going up? Amen. You going up? Some of you know you are. Because you understand the gospel and you know what the Word of God says. It's a very simple thing. I, I try never to change what I say about the gospel, not try to make it more creative, put it in different words, because I want you to hear it the same every time. It starts with some really bad news. All have sinned. I don't think I've ever run into a person who believed they hadn't sinned, but I guess there could be one. I can uh, guarantee you I wouldn't be around you very long before I could point out some. And you could point out some in my life. All have sinned. That's the bad news. The bad news gets worse. That's Romans 3.23. Romans 6.23 says, 
the wages of sin. Oh, yeah, payday's coming. Everybody who sins is going to pay for it. Sinner, payment, payment for sin is death. But we're all going to die. No, 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 no. This different kind of death. Physical death is uh, separation from the body. Yeah, that will all die. Um, spiritual death. Separation from God for all eternity. The wages of sin is death. But you've got to be thankful for a conjunction there. Wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Free gift. Well, then let him just put it in my post office box. No, you got to receive it. It's through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, you don't just add, automatically get it added to your account. You have to <coughs> receive Him as Savior. I, I can't imagine going through life and especially sitting through church where some of you haven't done that. Why? If this is all you want, it's all you get. But if you want eternal life, wake up. Listen to the good news that you have to do something about. Bow your heads with me. Some of you know exactly who I'm talking to. You, you know you haven't trusted Jesus. It gets around. Things you say to other people. Things you say to your spouse. Things your children say to you. Um, I'm going to ask you to do away with your pride for a moment this morning. It's not worth being so proud that you end up in hell because of it. I'm not going to go on and on this morning, but this is the issue, folks. Here's the deal. Jesus Christ offers you a free gift. If you are sitting here this morning and you have not accepted that free gift, going to this church is getting you nowhere except inoculated to the gospel. So I'm going to ask you right now, here's the pride issue. You're sitting here this morning and you say, Pastor, I do not know for certain that if I were to die today, I would go to heaven. I, I, I do not know. I want you to raise your hand. I do not know. I do not know. Some of you are lying. And I'm being ugly, I know. But your, your eternal life is on the line. Be proud. If you don't know, you can know this morning. As simple as right where you sit. You can pray prayer after me. No, nothing magic in the prayer. You can come talk with one of our men afterwards. Father, I realize I'm a sinner. Not much of a way I can get around that. But Father, this morning, I want to put my pride aside and I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I want to trust Him. I've trusted myself. I haven't done all that bad, but uh, I have no power in of myself to face eternity. So I trust Jesus as my Savior. And if you will ask Him to be your Savior right now, He will come into your life. He will give you eternal life. 